talk about some Registration 101 for timers. Um, it's gonna be pretty basic in terms of a couple of uh, registration setup, just some things to look out for. Um, and then we're gonna get into a little bit more of some specific timer settings that we see um, kind of are necessary, sometimes are get missed or anything like that. So um, my name is Kevin Lai. Uh, I'm the manager of our support team. I'm Chris May, I, uh, I'm on InfoAt. I'm on race day scoring support and race joy, race joy support. So if you've ever sent in a ticket, you've probably talked to me. If you send in anything on the weekends, um, make sure you're nice to him today. Uh, <laughs> Cause he's the one that uh, answers everything on the weekend. So Chris is our weekend guy. We have another gentleman, Dave Hunt, who's also on the weekend as well. So two people to be nice to remember. <laughs> um, so yeah, we're gonna go over some race setup, um, some basic website customization, and then some essential timing settings for, for timers. So the first thing I want to talk about is um, why create a race. Um, how many here are very new to run sign up? Anyone? Got a couple. Cool. So um, why do you want to create, create create a race? So a race on run sign up is basically your central place to manage um, all of your data and tons of features. Um, has every you know super easy tools every point of, of, of a race life cycle. So you have your um, giveaways, your, your check-in, your, your online registrations, your on-site registrations, sort of from start to finish, we have sort of all the tools for, for your entire race. Um, we allow you to renew your race. So renewing your race allows you to main, maintain all of your data into one specific spot. Um, we often see, and we can fix it, but we often see races, instead of renewing their race, they create a whole new race for the next year. And the issue that is the issue with that is you lose your data from year to year. Theoretically, you can copy and paste all of your data from your participant data, your email list, and everything like that. Um, your sponsor setup, your giveaway setup, all that stuff. When you create a new race, gets lost in translation. So when you renew your race, all that stuff kind of stays within the one um, kind of dashboard. So always renew your race. It uh, makes your life a lot easier. Um, for, for timers, for you guys specifically, if you guys use race day scoring, all of the data points sync automatically from run sign up to race day scoring. So, um, you know, a lot of you, if you guys use race director, if you guys know pull mode and push mode, you're always either pulling down data or you're pushing data up. With race day scoring, um, we can do bi-directional syncs. So if uh, on race morning, someone registers, um, you basically automatically just get that data down into race day scoring. If you want to, if you need to make a change on an age because uh, someone came into your timing van 8.30 in the morning, they said, I'm not 12, I'm 22, you can just make the change in race day scoring and that automatically gets pushed up to run sign up. So you don't have to worry about being in the right push or pull mode, which always I know is a bit of a hassle in race directory. Um, yeah, and so you can start from the homepage from runsign.com and to kind of hit that create race button um, and then you can get your race started. All right, so the first step, uh, we're talking about going back into the race wizard. So when you click create a race, take you to the first step of the race wizard, everybody here has done it. If you have created a race in there, you can also access it through the dashboard to make any important changes. Um, anything that you have set up initially when you renew the race, same thing, takes you back into the wizard. You can update the key information and then there are other changes you can make further on. So in, uh, in step one of the race, wizard this is where you you know create your race create your race description and set up your url <clears throat> one of the most common things we see in support is a url update request you guys can't do that you can create custom urls and different things like that but once you set up this url it can't be changed by anybody other than a run sign up admin um, so we strongly strongly recommend do not put years in do not put six annual things like that Otherwise you will request to update every single year and it just adds length to your URL, which we all know is not as easy to market the longer it is. We can, yes. We, we will help you. We are support, we will help you. The question is, can we, can we change it? Is it a one-time thing? No, it is not a one-time thing. We just encourage you to, you can change your event name every single year. So. But anyone can, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> of course. To clarify for the video, yes. it wasn't her. <laughs> so every year we do encourage you to 
you can change the event name to seventh annual, eighth annual, ninth annual. Just the URL, let's let's try to keep it simple. Yeah. So yeah, I just had a, a, someone who supports and I think so you get it, right? And then it's just Yep. And we we can change that. Okay. And we when we do change that, we do recommend if it is as a timer, if it is a race director and you need them to email us or if you are emailing on their behalf, we will give the same recommendation is I'm, I'm removing it in the future on races. Don't add years. Don't add timeframes. You can do that in the event name. You can do that in the description because you guys can all go back and edit the event name in the description. We can edit the URL. There are situations where um, a URL is taken so that like a previous race has already done like a you know, twilight 5k, you know, something common like that. So in those situations, there might be, um, uh, we might say like, hey, this URL is already taken. And you might maybe say, add like the city name of the race and say, you know, Augusta Twilight 5K, something like that. So continuation of step one of the race wizard, um, the race contact email. That is the email that you're gonna wanna put in to receive any questions. There is There are a few things that we will go over later on how that looks, but that should always be, if you have an info at email or whoever fields your race's questions or your timing company's questions, that should be what's entered in the race contact email because that will be how the participants contact you with any concerns they have, result questions, different things like that. Uh, the other thing on step one of the race wizard is where you set up your events. Um, so this is where each event will need to be create, created individually. Um, you do not want to add them all as one event, 5K or 10K or half marathon. Those can all be separate events, which gives you a lot more control, especially in the timing aspect of everything. All right. All right, so then down at the bottom, um, we do have an agreement that you have to make before proceeding, pretty standard stuff. Um, and you can also put your race in draft mode from here. And when I was talking about re-entering the race wizard after you've already created, this is also where you can publish your race by taking it out of draft mode with this little checkbox that you see down at the bottom. And then simply con continuing, it won't show. So step two of the wizard, uh, it's under the event, event information. Um, there's a couple settings here that you can do, um, specifically setting up your race distance, um, kind of start and end time of, of the event. The main thing, step two is sort of a, not a highly used um, step in the wizard. Um, the main thing in this setup that I see a lot of timers get tricked up on is uh, this age calculation base date. Um, a lot of triathlons, if you guys have ever timed a triathlon, they require your, your age be calculated at the end of the year. So, uh, like, you know, I think USAT, they always say, you know, your age is at year end age. So that you have to calculate your age based on 1231 enter year. Um, sometimes for whatever reason, some races just put a random date in there and they don't actually need it. So you'll get, we get questions on, you know, why are my participants showing as a year older or a year younger? Um, this is step two of the wizard is sort of where you find that setting. Um, but again, if you guys time um, triathlons, um, this is the age based, the age calculation based state is where you can change sort of how you calculate your age. And I'm pretty sure that's a requirement for, for those types of triathlons. All right. So race three is where you set up your, your pricing. It's where your registration options are. You can see in the image here, you have your, <clears throat> when a registration opens, when it closes, this is where you would set up, you know, different price points as, as you get closer to the race, you want to increase the price. You can control all of that from step three of the race wizard. If you have a race that has 20 events with price increases at the same time, every single month, you can create it one time, copy to all of your other events. And then if you need to just simply update the pricing, at least your dates are already there. So there is a lot of functionality that allow, makes it a little easier to use when setting up your registrations. Um, that's the create pricing tiers that we were talking about. Um, you can also see some of the registration options that we have here. I have seen in support people that will disable registration and forget that they've done that. And then people can no longer register for the race. Um, there's a, this is also commonly used for children's runs. If they need to be under a certain age, you can set the age limitations right here for how old they are to register. Um, if somebody outside of that age tries to register, they will receive a red pop-up box on run sign up, letting them know that they don't qualify for the registration of that event. Um, 
And then when you, once you move forward and once you've created this, you can reaccess this without going back into the race wizard by going to your dashboard, selecting race registration, then dates, pricing, and options. And you'll see the, the tiers broken down if you need to make any edits or anything like that. Okay, step four, giveaways. Get a shirt. Okay, next. I'm just kidding. Um, so giveaways, obviously, um, we allow you to set up uh, giveaways for each uh, registration event. Um, you can set up uh, kind of sizing for your giveaways. You can add images. Um, you can add extra fees if you have specific giveaways. Oftentimes, this is for um, an uncommon t-shirt size that you need to charge uh, an extra dollar or two dollars. Um, you can do that there. Um, you can use the giveaway uh, inventory to sort of manage your inventory levels. Um, if you guys, pro tip, if you guys use giveaway inventories, set that up at the beginning. Um, sometimes when, um, what, what we see a lot is giveaways get deleted, then they set up an inventory. People have already selected a deleted giveaway. It's all sorts of confused. So I would highly recommend if you look into giveaway inventories, uh, set that up and think about that before registration opens and you start getting participants um, kind of registering for, for your race. Don't have any shirts you have at the beginning. You put like a number in there that you can change. Yes, it yes. Yeah. So you can start with like 100 mm -hmm. shirts or something. Yep, like yes. The other thing here, um, just a helpful tip, add a no shirt option. If people are doing all of your races, they really don't want a t-shirt. Sometimes that trips them up and you can just write no shirt and they will, you will see people select that from time to time. All right, so step five of the race wizard, pretty self-explanatory. This is where you can set up your uh, race logo and you can set up your banner image. There's a lot more customization outside of that, uh, but this is just the initial setup, your race logo, your banner image. If you wanna go beyond that, we will touch on that in a little bit. Um, step six, uh, payments. Kevin Harris, where is he? Just kidding. Um, so yeah, obviously, if, if you are setting up a new race, you'll need to create a payment account. Um, if, if you are just creating a race for uh, a specific race, you can send uh, payment instructions to um, the you know, CFO or the financial person of that specific organization so that they can go ahead and create the payment account. Um, not too much, you know, we're PCI level one, um, we're a payment facilitator. Uh, the underwriting process is there to protect races and charities. Um, and so, yeah, there's a you know, create a new payment. If you have an existing payment account, you can just use one of your existing payment accounts. Um, so step six is pretty, uh, you know, the race was is a pretty straightforward um, process there. And then once you get through the payment, you are all set with kind of creating the basic um, of your race. Obviously, um, from here, you can go to your dashboard, um, which then kind of gives you a whole host of, of customizations. Um, and then you can visit your race website. Um, surprisingly, we get a lot of questions. It says, uh, where is my race website? Um, so you can, always, you can always hit that view, visit your race, race website. And that's sort of the... Uh, uh, page that the participants will see. All right. So once you uh, once you've created and gone through the the race was this is where we were mentioning about the customization options. So Bob and Allison did talk about how the website builder is we're thinking about it. We're we're eventually going to have it available for races, but for right now, this is how you would customize uh, your race page. Um, so everything is, is accessed under the, the race dashboard by going to race and then race website. You'll see some of the sub options written right here. Um, the race thing theme is kind of where you can, you know, start to color code things. Uh, you can update your, your race logo, different things like that. Uh, we strongly encourage if you haven't used cover pages, test it out. It's awesome. It gives you a ton of control. It gives you more options than your default dashboard. Um, you can add a lot of different features. You can add YouTube videos, a lot of cool stuff under the cover pages. Uh, there's also custom sections and custom content display, which allows you to create new options at the top of your dashboard. Um, we see people do that if they're selling sponsorships, there is a URL that you can generate. That's a whole different area that we're not gonna get into, but you can create a new page for them at the top of your website so that people can access stuff a little bit easier. Or if you have a YouTube channel, you could add that there that you want people to look at and watch your videos, stuff like that. 
Okay, we blew through that because we wanted to get through to kind of some of these settings kind of on a quicker, yeah. quicker time frame. So we're going to start getting into some of these settings that we think are pretty relevant to you guys as timers um, and things that we see um, not a lot of people, you know, some races missing out and, and not, not just understanding. Um, so the first thing we're going to talk about is result notifications. Um, so result notifications are either text or email notifications um, to participants when uh, their result gets posted to run sign up. So little ca there's a couple of caveats with this. Um, it requires um, participants to um, basically sign up for these notifications. So the issue with result notifications that we often see is uh, it's Saturday morning, race starts at 9 a.m., 7.30 a.m., and we get an email and they, the race wants to learn how to enable text result notifications. We can help them enable it. That's not a problem. Um, the issue is uh, since they haven't you know, basically set up their devices to receive and they haven't, um, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? They haven't allowed their devices and basically given permission for us to send them a text, um, nothing's gonna happen. Um, so definitely get this set up um, early, um, mark it out um, during the registration process, as long as um, result notifications is turned on. During the registration process, they will be prompted with a uh, uh, sort of a message that says, you know, sign up for text notifications, sign up for email notifications. Um, if you guys go into the demo room, um, when you guys are using the on-site registration, there, there is a basically a part in it that says, you know, sign me up for text. And then when you go through the demo and you basically get your result, you should get a text that says, you know, so-and-so finished in, in this amount of time. So this is something that we definitely recommend setting up early. Um, don't want to do it um, late. Um, and it's found under race day tools, results, and then set up result notifications. Um, importantly, it can be also set up for split notifications. So if you push up splits, um, those split notifications will also go out to the um, phone or email address that they put in. All right, finishing time display. Um, how many people here have had a race director say, hey, I'm not seeing any finishing times when they post them? I saw the smile there, so I assumed you have gone through this. Uh, this is actually something we see pretty regularly. Uh, a lot of times um, a race director will be in there. They will be setting up their race a certain way. They see this participant display option under race display participant displays. They don't care about the finish time at that point in time, so they turn it off. Look at the results, zero times, just names, genders, ages, all the stuff that you really don't need. You need the times. It's typically in here. We get a lot of support emails about this. We absolutely can help you, but you as a timer, if you get a race director that is saying, hey, there are no times and you are absolutely positive you pushed up times, this is 100% where it's going to be. It will be under race, display, participant display, and all you need to do is check that on. There are a few other things that do get turned off here and there. Finishing time is the one that affects you guys the most. We, uh, we, have, we have gotten it so much that even the development team helped us out a little bit. Yep. And uh, they added this warning that basically says, you know, you need to enable it under this participant display. Um, for years, that was never a thing. You would just get an email from, we'd just get an email from the timer or the race that said, what the heck's going on here? I've, no, I've got no times, everything looks good. Race director's looking good, race scoring is looking good, run score is looking good. What is going on here? And it's just a simple little setting here. So we have added um, a warning message now. So hopefully that resolves um, those types of issues. But this is sort of what it looks like. You, you can just see that it's just, you know, bib, place, name, you know, gender, your city, your state, your country. And that's all the result um, set shows. So there's no time or anything like that. Um, so yeah, we, we get that a lot. And I thought it was very important to put this one in here. <laughs> So the next thing um, that I want to talk about is sort of race day registration, the whole gamut of race day registration. Um, for you guys as timers, um, race morning is, I, I know a lot of you guys at time are also basically part of the event. You guys are there to help the event run smoothly. And part of that is kind of everything that goes on on race day morning. Um, so with race day registration, we always, always, always recommend having some type of solution for race day registration. Obviously, in the past, um, it's you know hand, it's paper, cash, and then um, 
10 minutes of uh, sweaty palms typing in a sweaty hot band and trying to get all the data in there correctly. And then you misspell an age, whatever, you get all these errors, right? So obviously that is still an option, but we have a ton of tools that try to help eliminate um, some of those um, stressful situations. Um, the first one that I, I wanna talk about is um, on-site registration. So if you guys have been with us for years, you guys can probably remember when we used to have Expo mode. Um, this is essentially Expo mode. Um, it's, uh, you can set it up on uh, any laptop and it can act as a kiosk. Um, it, allow, it does allow you to take cash payment um, and you can do, you can assign bibs there. You can restrict it to certain events. Um, you can customize sort of the required fields. The, the main thing with race day registration, whether you're using onsite, whether you're using you know, people's devices or anything like that, you always wanna make sure that um, you're customizing sort of what's required um, because race morning, typically, what do you guys care about as timers? What, what data do you guys need? First, first name, last name, age, gender. Do you care about city? Do you care about, do you care about phone number? No, do you, do you care about, you know, their fundraisers? No, you don't care about any of that, right? So with on-site registration, we allow you to sort of customize what's required. So you just want to basically set your basic things that you need, your, your date of birth, your gender, your first name, your last name. Yeah. Does that get around the credit card requirements? If you set up the cash payment option. Right, that's cash only. But if someone wants to pay with a credit card, yes. you still need to collect the rest of the yeah, yes, yeah, so that's a different section on the registration page. Yeah, so, so like if their name is in the registration, they'll still have to fill out the credit card information with first, last. Well, no, some credit cards require you to have the address too. Uh, so, so when, you, when you're paying the credit card, you're still prompted with like the name on the card, the address, and all that that's information. On that's on a separate yeah. page. So, yeah. this is, you know, when you hit register and um, you got to fill in your information. Oh, yeah. But there used to be warning messages when I would uh, check zip code. No, so yeah, it's yeah, it's totally yeah. different now. Yeah, so when you, in on-site registration, it's basically the same registration path as doing it on a computer. Okay. We, we just kind of give you some of these um, tools and streamlines and, and everything like that. Um, the other thing too is on-site registration. You can, if you go downstairs, you can take a look at it. At the end, when you check out and you complete your registration, there's this next registrant button. And it just goes right to the start of the registration path. If they've logged in, they'll log, they'll get logged out. And then you just kind of go through the next person. So oftentimes, you know, you'll see, um, you'll see maybe one or two of these laptops with on-site registration um, kind of set up and just kind of right there, um, allowing people to come in and, and register. Um, the more common option that we recommend is um, using our QR code and then having participants just continue to register on their phone. Um, these days, everyone's got a smartphone. Everyone knows how their smartphone works. They're sort of used to how their device operates. Um, so what we always recommend is uh, keeping registration open. Um, and then you can set up QR codes and basically print them off and put them kind of in strategic places in and around your race. And you can say, um, you know, register for the race here. And I think everyone here knows that. Everyone kind of knows what QR codes now. COVID, QR code menus, they sort of know, oh, they see QR code without my camera, take a picture of it and everything like that. So you can create um, QR codes under promotion links and they're, it'll give you sort of a bunch of QR code options. Um, the one I recommend personally is using the sign up link QR code. So that QR code will take you directly to the sign up button. So that, that takes you into the sign up registration. It gets you right into the first step of registration. Um, we did this, um, Bob, we have, Bob hosts a little Scott coffee run in, in Morristown here. It's like a 800 person race. And, you know, my team, you know, Chris, we all handled sort of the, the race day check-in, the race day registration. And we basically printed off, you know, two or three of these QR codes, got some yard signs and just put them kind of in strategic places. And we did not have a line for registration. We had probably 30 to 40 people come in race morning that wanted to register. We just sent them to the, sent them to sort of the QR code. They were able to kind of get themselves registered and then they came in and kind of got themselves checked in and everything like that. 
Again, um, yeah. question. Yeah, go ahead. So when they check in, they're given a number or So the question is about check-in. So we'll get to check-in in the next step. Yeah. Yep. Um, so we'll so we'll talk. Yeah, we'll talk about that. So again, the thing with um, any race day registration, your registrations have to be open. Um, and if you guys work with races that are a little more old school and, um, you know, I, I talked to all these timers that are working with old school races that are still into paper. They have a lot of um, older, uh, older volunteers that aren't used to this. It's sort of just talking them about the benefits, talking about how much uh, life can be just chill and a lot easier race morning. Um, and, and we obviously always recommend testing. Um, for race day registration, you can always kind of test these QR codes, test the flow um, and everything like that. Yeah. Yeah. Again. Yeah. Yeah. My question is about the on-site registration for the state of Virginia and Cash scenario. Do they? So, like, if you have it set up on the website for this for the pricing to be like twenty-five dollars plus whatever the fee is. Obviously, I don't want to like you know charge them twenty-five, sixty. So it's like. Do they not pay the fee then? Yeah. So the question was about um, the processing fee for cash payments. Um, so obviously cash payment, they're not, the fee is a credit card fee. So if they're not, yeah. um, they're not paying, um, there's no fee in, in, involved. So when you set, have you set up cash payments before? Uh, I set it up. So when you end up, you, when you create the cash payment password, uh, where you see the coupon code normally is where you would put in that password. And then it just allows you to bypass all of the credit card information yeah. and things like that. Uh, another question that I, that comes up enough um, is uh, any manual imports. This is unrelated to this, but kind of related to, to, to yeah, exactly. So if you get any paper entries for whatever reason that, um, that come in from your race director, maybe your race director has two friends that they want to register and you're just importing them into run sign up. Similar, they're not paying on run sign up, so there's no, there's no um, processing fee involved with yep. that. So you could also use the on-site registration cash to enter those? Yeah. Or yeah, it's yeah, it's I personally, as I was timing, I personally wanted to avoid anything with that. So I personally would push them into whatever race day registration you've, solution that you've got, whether it's on site, whether it's telling them to go um, and register um, kind of on their phones or anything like that. Um, if it's like a friend or something like that, you can you can tell the race director to create like a coupon code and just say, hey, create this coupon code, name it free, give it to your friend. They can just register online. Um, I think as a timer, you've got, you know, you get there two hours, an hour and a half before you're trying to set up the, set up all the, the equipment. You've got just tons of things that you're trying to manage people. You're trying to manage the finish line. You're trying to manage last thing you want to know is, Hey, I got two random people I need you to import, you know? So I, I personally would recommend pushing them into whatever race day solution that you have. Plus if you have a coupon code, you still collect their information. You still get a signed waiver. You are covering any, you're covering all your bases with the coupon code. Right. So, yeah. so the uh, you said something about the rates uh, dates. So if I do day of the QR code, I have to extend the date to close. Yeah. So yes. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. So correct. So and you could close and then reopen too. Yeah. So the the question was about um, registration dates and and, uh, and everything like that. So yeah, when we say keep registrations open, let's say your race is is July first, nine a.m that last registration close date, have it July 1st, 9 a.m. or 9.05 a.m. if you have like last minute stragglers that wanna come in 9.30 a.m., something like that. That way, yeah, cause you know, in the, in the, in the olden days, you close race registration on Wednesday and then you process everything Thursday, Friday, you just, then you like pre-assign bibs Friday, then you start making packets Friday and you're losing two and a half, three days of potential people coming in. So if you keep your registration open, that's three days worth of registrations that you could have missed kind of if you were to close it. Um, and then obviously we, well, we'll talk about it, but you know, when you do dynamic bib assignment, it alleviates um, almost a day of work, of work um, by just assigning bibs when they come in and, and check in. Um, and we'll explain what, what that is in a, in a hot second. Again, you, you can go downstairs to the demo room and we are doing all of what we're talking about. We are doing on-site registration. We are doing dynamic bid assignment and check-in. 
Um, and then we're also using, like, say, scoring to, to time the race, but that's a whole other thing. Um, so, yeah, test. <laughs> Moral of the story, test. Uh, so this race day check-in, uh, if you weren't in the presentation earlier where we went into detail, or if... So before we get into this, who has used the check-in app? Who hasn't used the check-in app? Okay. It's, I think it's good to know kind of what yeah, we're working yeah, with perfect. and everything like that. Um, so for those of you who haven't, if you haven't gotten out of the demo room, when you do get a chance tonight, tomorrow, definitely go down and try it. Try it yourself. We will have people there that walk you through it. It's nice to get hands-on experience and actually see and feel how everything works. The, um, the developer is down there. Yes. So. Yes. <laughs> I right. ask for a better person down there. So you can access race day check-in again through the dashboard by going to your race day tools, race day check-in, and then clicking on the mobile app. I'm sure anybody who's used the mobile app has also used web check-in at some point. Mobile app is the way to go these days. Um, so what the check-in app allows you to do, Kevin alluded to it in the last present or the last slide, it makes the day more efficient. Um, it allows you to do things um, that typically used to take, you used to have to close your race registration down for. So now with the check-in app, dynamic bib assignment, things like that, you can have a much, much more efficient race day experience, plus you don't lose out on registration day. So ideally more revenue for you guys. Um, so you can see some of the images here. And like we said, you can also test downstairs. Um, it allows you to look up participants, check them in to the race so you know they're there and assign them bib numbers straight from the app. Once they're assigned a bib number, if you are using race day scoring, that is almost instantaneous that it pushes down to race day scoring with their bib number so that you as a timer, if, if the race director is running the, the packet pickup in the bib assignment, you will see it almost immediately. Um, there's also data changes that you can make uh, around presets and configurations, different things like this. It gives you a lot of control over how the race morning is gonna go. Um, it also allows you to set up uh, staff and volunteers with apps on their personal devices, or if you provide equipment for them, it allows you to set them up and configure them a certain way based on who's the one that is checking people in. Um, you can also give them the power to just simply check somebody in. You can give them the power to uh, change data if, they're, if you are allowing people to switch sizes of shirts, but you still wanna know how many sizes of each shirt was taken, it'll edit it there. Um, the other great thing with the check-in app, stats. Timers love data. You love data. There are stats in the app. There are stats on the back end and run sign up. It gives you a good idea. Uh, you can set a device identifier for every device, for every phone. You can give them names. Otherwise, they show up as iOS or Android. Um, you can see if you're staffed well enough for your, your check-in so that next year, if you need to add a couple more volunteers, something like that, you can check things like giveaways. Uh, you can also check percentage checked in versus percentage signed up. We all like to know what, what the drop-off number is the day of an event. Could have been a stormy year. Might have a bigger drop-off number. You can check all of that. Yeah, so the question was about check-in. So there's a really cool function um, that was sort of limited in our old check-in app, um, but it's called um, the late adventure. So when you check now, you can basically enable it to certain time of the So there's a couple ways people recall the late adventure. One is to show the same transaction, um, not the same thing, the same fundraising team. That's it. I think that's it. So let's say, you and I register, or you register at the same time. I have this related registration on. When I come in and pick up my bid, that's the related registration. And it'll say, buy Uber soon. And it'll say, do you also want to check in for so and so? If it's if yes, then you just click on that person and it goes through the check in process. Um, it's a really, really useful tool because more often than not, one person coming in and picking up for a So it's like a fast on where it's one bid for the team. If it's one bid for the team, it's just it's essentially just one person coming in. Um, so it's a, it's a pretty cool function that that related registration got expanded um, by the guest that was down there that kind of just wanted to expand that for each fundraising team. So um, it's a really nifty feature. Um, but again, you want to make your life easier, uh, make your life efficient. So you can just basically find instead of having to ask that person for their name, search it on that computer. Um, 
oh, are you also checking your national security? It happens all the time. That happens at Scott Copper. Yeah, and you'll notice the common theme is test. Um, there are, you can set the dates for when the check-in app is available on the run sign up in the dashboard. Um, open that window. You set a password, nobody else is gonna access it and screw up your data. So if you wanna, if you wanna check that right now, if you were to have an event that's a, that has a relay, you can check it right now. Just enable it, set your password, pop in there. You can always uncheck people too. You can always delete bib numbers. We're doing that downstairs all day. So you're not gonna break anything. If you do break something, email me. <laughs> I was talking to some people. Okay. I was talking to some people earlier today about you know this. Uh, they figured out something to make t the t-shirt pick up easy. Um, it's like I have some race directors who they'd rather just have it separate, and that's awesome because then I don't have to deal with it at registration but, or at, at hack pickup. Um, it will pick up, I guess. But then. Sometimes people don't prep all that stuff and then they put it kind of like you know, that if you have to crawl to it that might be a stupid thing. So this is a good so the, the question was uh, is there any tips or tricks with with handling t-shirt pickup without obviously bogging down the race check-in, right? Yeah, getting a robot would be great. Um, so this is where like the presets and the configurations come in. Uh, you could you can set the presets as the timer where you could just do a simple like shirt pickup preset, right? And then you can configure it to two volunteers, set up their devices for them or help them set up their devices or tell them what to, when you're, you're prompted what configuration to pick when you sign on to the check-in app and you can have them separate. So like even here today, there were people that checked in first over at the table at the symposium and then they came over to get their shirt and instead of shouting back and forth i had a preset created for the run sign up symposium where i don't have to check anyone in i can just click on their name and see their data and their data included shirt size so you have a little bit more control of that and that's something you can offer as the timer to a race of hey you have two people that are willing to basically sort through sizes essentially and hand them out i'll set them up with two devices and they're good to go Yes. <laughs> yes. So, so that'd be cool too. Maybe there'd yeah. be a checkbox for shirt pickup or something. Yeah, definitely something. You could you could also create a custom question on the sign up. Did you pick up your shirt? Oh, that's <laughs> yes. That's great. Yep. That's great. Uh, and then you you make that an, uh, an internal question. Yeah. Yep. That, you don't want that question. Yeah. But then just add that information to the preset that you're already creating, and you can just give them. You can give the volunteer that's doing that the simple data of they're they're allowed the only thing they're allowed to manage is the question and they can see first name last name shirt size they don't need any other information besides that okay Yes, 
so again, anecdotally, we when we did our Scott Poppy waste morning packet pickup, it was myself, Chris, Dave, Allison, Andrew, even I think Andrew. <laughs> And we had one person doing the on-site registration with people, but what they were doing was walking people away from the check-in, scanning that QR code that we talked about earlier, and then that's instantaneous. So as soon as they register using that QR code, we got a lot of questions of, well, how long till I show up in the check-in app? Immediate. As soon as they register, send them straight to that to pick up their shirt and get checked in, and they're good to go. Yeah. That is when you assign the bib number is during that check-in process. Yes. So, yeah. So you know, so you pre-tag your bids. Yep. So you want you want your yeah, you want your bids to already be pre-tagged. So they're ready to go. They're ready to be able to get the bids and then get them done. Dynamic bid assigning is saying, okay, I've got a pile of bids from a thousand to fifteen hundred that no one has to do. Packet pickup is from Thursday to Friday and then also in the morning. People come in and they say, Hey, I'm here to pick up the packet. In the check-in app, you can say, okay, cool. Chris May, you're here today. Let's give you bids that way. No, there, the, there are numbers on your bibs and chips, right? You have everything created, but it's not associated with a person until you check them in. Once you check them in, you enter their bib number, you save and continue. They're checked in, they have their bib, and you're good to go. So that's assuming they don't lose it. Yeah, so that saves. also a good spot to use the uh, check and app stats to know uh, like I know at Scott's coffee run we have all all the bibs set up they weren't all chipped we didn't know what the the turnout was going to be so we just monitored the stats every once in a while and if it seemed like like obviously you can use a, a straight count of the bibs but if it seemed like we were getting close to the number that we were at we just started chipping some more bibs so that they're readily available so they're, they're you're trying to eliminate downtime essentially so what I'm saying is can you, the person gets up uh, so when the, when the person comes to register, they get the QR code, they put all the information in, now I go to the registration, they, they pick up the next number, 55, machine, and they do 55, then I think that was they're putting on there. Yeah, so make sure that their age is right. Yeah, so, you know, because people still make mistakes. I'm a female, but I'm yeah. 55, but I'm a male. So label printing. That essentially so sit with Scott Coffee because this is before they were sent to each other. We would write their last name um, on the back of it. The idea is that you check in five people. There's not a chance on a cover who the big numbers belong to. So we write the last name of you know, 55 on the back of 55. We write Scott. One of the first things that they check them. Yeah. Yeah. You just write down the person. Yeah. So they know who's is who. So, yep. So, uh, the bid label, the, the purpose of a bid label is so you could eliminate the right name labor, but you can also put the giveaway size on the back of the bid label. So if you're doing packet pickup, let's say you have a section for your, your, your bid pickup and then another table for your pickup, you, you, you check them in, you hit their bid, you put the bid label on the back and have the giveaway sign. They move to the next station to go split their bid. The person says, give away large pool, I got a large here, right on. It's just official, no asking, no asking. 
and the, bit, the label printing kind of provides more information that would be useful for that. You could actually just check off on that label, right? Yeah. 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 Is another way to know that you yeah. gave yeah. yeah. the Yes. Again, it's like, again, redundancy. Yeah. 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 At a time where you guys know what redundancies are in the camera stand and everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. Same thing with checking, kind of have find ways to make sure the mistakes are not being made in the right checking process. Because again, um, for for packet pickup, you guys are relying on volunteers who maybe do this once, twice, twice a year. So finding ways to minimize that and giving them a process um, to do things in sort of printing off steps, labeling it, just putting it on the table could also be another very cheap, uh, easy way to make sure the volunteers know what to do. So I just I think let me come in and see what the other side of the board does. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. That is that's absolutely fine. I think the more we can merge the two in terms of understanding what what goes to it, this remains maybe a year's on the next year. That's what I was asking. This or this or this. Exactly. So yeah, race day, race day registration is, is, is almost uh, it's very, it's It is. Very and you can test all those things uh, on the dashboard now, promotion links. Yes. No. No. On on your dashboard, there will be a, an item that says promotions, right. and there'll be a sub item that says links. And then there you will be provided with several QR codes. So there's, there's a QR code that takes you to your race page. There's a QR code that takes you into, like Kevin said, the first step of the signup process, which is what we recommend for race day registration type thing. Um, I believe there's one that takes you to sponsors, donations. Basically, when you enable something, you can get a QR code for it. Correct. Yep. Yeah. Another thing that, you know, yeah, there, you have QR codes for results. So class of those is kind of wherever you want. So if you're Anywhere near the finish line, throw those QR codes up. Less questions under the timer tent. We all know we love questions under the timer tent. Who, who still yeah. 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 Yep. 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 It's, it's a divided thing, I feel like. With, with you can also send the results. Yep. yep. There, there's a ton of ways that you can uh, minimize the um, Yeah. You know, we have some kiosk options. We have some kiosk options. There's a ton of options that we can use. Um, with printing paper, it's always as a time save. Yeah. yeah. There, I, I did when I was a timer. I did have a race. Part of the race day experience was they had a big board that they would take paper results on. So even though they can access it, that's just that was part of the allure of the race. Is everyone would be standing around anxious, and then you see the race director walking. He's still walking from the same timing tent where I can see the same exact thing, but it was part of the allure of the race. Is I still offered him paper so that he could put it up, turn, talk to everybody, and then get out of the way, and everyone goes and looks. And it was a relatively fast race. Um, they switched to chip timing versus gun timing to make it more secretive. Um, so it was, that was just part of the race, but still the same set of results that are in the QR, QR code. Yeah, it's something that's been addressed, but that would actually be better to go to the demo room and talk to Avery about. He's right down there and he's got the, he's got everything. Yeah. Right. 
Right. Yep. If you have the equipment, set up a result kiosk. That and scrolling results, because I know like during kiosk, you don't want people touching everything. But there are like if you if you're a race day scoring timer, there are scrolling results. That live results link when you're in the reports, it'll just say and you can configure that slightly. Um, you can still put that up on a TV and just have it scrolling all the time if people are. It's not a big thing. Right. I can see it. Yep. Yep. Like I said, just put it by the snacks. There you go. <laughs> yep. So it's, you know, we have tons of options. Um, we understand that at times you guys have different clients, different needs. And so the idea is um, that we try to be able to give you the best options, the most yes. options, the most amount of possible for the people that to be able to solve this guys can't solve an issue or something comes up and it's odd, again, just email support. Yeah. Um, you know, we have, we have someone on you know, every day, Monday through Sunday. And, um, you guys have email back today, you can just get me, you can get, get Chris now, you can get Allison now, you can get Dave now, just get Andrew. Um, we've got uh, uh, a very dedicated team of ex yeah. ex people that have yes. issues that can understand your life and get your problems. So you can be having an issue with the phone and they're going right next to you. Music blaring and, and it's stressful as heck. We get it. We, we get it. <laughs> well, been fair. So, yeah. Any last minute questions before we end? And also, if you if you think of something, we're around. I'm going to be in the demo room all day tomorrow. So if you want to have a conversation, talk through anything, let us know. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you.